My name is Nimata Blyden, Nima, um, to, to my friends. And I'm a um, professor of history at George Washington University, studying Africa and the African diaspora. And what aspect of diaspora history do you cover? So my research has focused on the connections between Africa and its diaspora. My dissertation, which was my first book, looked at West Indians or men and women of Caribbean descent who settled in Sierra Leone in the 19th century. And uh, my forthcoming book looks at African-American engagement with the African continent. You know, as soon as I heard your name, Blyden, I immediately thought of that luminary. Edward Blyden, is he related to you? Yes, Edward Wilmot Blyden was my great-grandfather on my maternal side, so he was my father's grandfather. Wow. And um, what can you tell us about him? So, Edward Wilmot Blyden is known as a Pan-Africanist, so a 19th, sort of the, one of the early, early proponents of Pan-Africanism in the 19th century. He was born in the Virgin Islands, which was then the Danish Virgin Islands, and, and at the age of 18 made his way to Liberia, which was of course settled as a colony um, for African Americans in 1820, and um, lived out his life in, in Africa and was a champion of African peoples, uh, very proud of his heritage, very proud of his blackness. He wrote a lot about that. and. Um, so, sort of the father, a father of Pan-Africanism, one of the fathers of Pan-Africanism. I saw somewhere that um, he was involved in Liberia, Sierra Leone, mm -hmm. and also Nigeria, right? Well, his connection to, like, to Nigeria, um, I must admit, I don't know that much about, although there's a wonderful picture that we've just recently um, found, and we didn't discover it, but somebody sent it to me in an email, where he's in Nigeria, in Lagos, sitting among... Nigerian chiefs. So he did travel throughout West Africa. He, he was mainly in Liberia, spent the rest of his life, the latter, latter part of his life in Sierra Leone, um, but traveled. I mean, he made a trek to Futajalon, for example, and, and traveled to, to Nigeria, made these trips. So he, he did have a connection to Nigeria in that way, probably more than I'm, I'm saying, because I just don't know. The picture, I think, was Lagos, but I'm not mm -hmm. sure. Knowing him, he might have gone to the north because, of course, he was very much a, um, a champion of Islam as far as its influence on Africans. He, his major work, perhaps his major work, or the work that he's most known for, is um, Christianity, Islam, and the Negro race, um, where he makes the argument that Islam was perhaps more favorable in its approach to conversion of Africans than Christianity was. Um, so he did. He, he was a scholar of Arabic, and um, so mm, I didn't know that. Yes, he was. He he was. A, he wrote in Arabic, and as a matter of fact, just again a few years ago, a young woman who was doing research in an archive um, sent me a transcript of a document that he had translated from the Arabic to to English. So he was well versed in very well versed in languages, but in Arabic as well. Well, it seems to me that he wrote a lot of books. I, I got about 19 or 20. How he, many books did he, he did. produce? So, you know, I, I thought about that, and I didn't, you know, it's hard to count because so many of his works were published. His speeches were published. Um, um, you know, lectures that he gave were published. So, as I said, Christianity, Islam, and the Negro Race is probably his most known publication. Um, also, just before he died, he published African Life and Customs. Um, and um, so he many publications, but those are sort of the two major published works. But he, he wrote a lot from West Africa to Palestine, which was a chronicle of his journey to, um, to the Middle East. Um, and he talks about traveling through, through Egypt um, and into the Middle East. So very prolific. And Edward Blyden was a Pan-Africanist. But what? Maybe the father of Pan-Africanism. Many, many call him that. Yeah. What did Pan-Africanism mean to him? So while he probably didn't use that term, I think based on what he wrote, what I would say is that he believed in this idea of um, African, Africa for Africans. Definitely that was uh, um, 
can be seen throughout his, his writing. Um, so he is credited for uh, writing about this concept of African personality, which is an argument that there was a distinct African essence, African personality, if you will, which should be developed um, and not emulative of Europe, distinct from Europeans, that Africans should take pride in their history, take pride in their culture. So I think throughout his life, he always put Africa at the center. So um, when I was writing my book on West Indians and West Africa, one of my readers um, commented that I needed to engage with Blyden as a West Indian. Why wasn't he more central in that book? And one of the arguments that I made is that I don't think there's a piece of writing by Edward Blyden where he refers to himself as anything other than an African. Mm -hmm. So though he was born in the Caribbean, he never spoke of himself as anything other than as an African. And so this idea of Africa at the center, Africans at the, at the center, is something that he developed particularly as he lived in Liberia. So like many um, diasporan blacks who returned, quote unquote, to Africa, he did go back with that idea of uplift and, you know, we're here to uplift the, the continent of our ancestors. But in his writing, you see how he gradually develops to understand that Africans had more to give those who came back than they had to give it. And so throughout his life, he, he spoke of, of Africa, this African personality, and this need for Africans to, Africa to reach out to its sons rather than sons to, to in some way reach out to Africa to develop it. I, I guess Africa for Africans would come in in the context of the various occupations that took place, Absolutely. you know, Absolutely. The, so it's uh, actually a, an anti-colonial uh, slogan in a way. Mm -hmm. We recall that in 1884, 85, you have uh, Bismarck and the, um, what is usually referred to as the scramble, scramble. for Africa. It was really an invasion mm -hmm. um, of the continent right. and the occupation of Germany, yes. France, Britain, right. we have to also add uh, the fact that Portugal would step up its uh, expansionist role, expansionist imperialist role in areas such as uh, Mozambique. And then of course we have the Italians who definitely um, by the late 80s, you know, would be right. <laughs> definitely um, mm -hmm. showing uh, undue interest. Exactly. Anonization, occupation, well, invasion exactly. of his Africa for Africans. Absolutely, and this is why he continued to resonate into the nationalist era, why people like Casely Hayford, why nationalist leaders um, up to, you know, Kwame Nkrumah Zikwe was citing Blyden and his concept of Africa for Africans because this whole idea that um, African people were equipped to run their own governments, African people were equipped to take care of their own societies was something that he wrote about that resonated with later nationalists moving into the period of independence and why in many ways Blyden continues to be relevant um, and continues to be cited for his writings on when, it, when we have conversations about African pride or African nationality or, or African personality. You know, but, well, um, some of the other Pan-Africanists of the, of the day. They, they, we, we do well, uh, many Pan-Africanists, but not all. Um, he met Frederick Douglass, he met um, Casely Hayford, of course, I believe um, Casely Hayford wrote the introduction to, um, to Christianity, Islam, and the Negro race, so I'm assuming they met. We don't know if he met W.B. Du Bois, but um, in the Du Bois collection, there is a letter from Dr. Du Bois asking Blyden to contribute to his encyclopedia. Um, so we do know indeed that though they may not have met, they certainly corresponded. That's interesting it is, and, and it important is. to note. It's a very important letter um, mm -hmm. because, he, of course, in some ways, he is the successor to Blyden in terms of in terms of Pan Africanism. Absolutely. So, what about um, archival material? 
Where would we find the bulk of such? Unfortunately, man, much of his papers were lost. Um, of course, not in, not, not in their entirety because books have been written about Edward Wilmot Blyden. But his letters do survive um, in a in compilation that's been published. But the Schomburg, I believe, has um, his letters. The British Library has uh, some of his, his writings. And of course, um, he was also an, a newspaper editor during certain periods of his life, and some of the newspapers that he published or he was editor of survive in, in parts of the world. So uh, don't have a lot of his original writing, certainly not in the family anymore, but there are surviving writings by him, quite a bit, as a matter of fact. Well, I was about to ask, what about you? You don't have any of his stuff? No, I, we have personal items. Um, um, some of his books we do have that were not written by him, but that, you know, he owned. Um, and I have a little box that was given to him as a gift in sometime in the early 20th century. So we have little personal mementos of him, but we don't have, unfortunately, um, and I don't know the family history of that, but his, his papers that were left in the family were either destroyed or lost. Um, and unfortunately, that's, that's the sad part of it. But enough that... Do you have enough for a private museum in there? Um, we don't. I don't think we do. I don't mm. think we do. No. No, mm. unfortunately. That's, and you know, that's, this is the story of diaspora. Mm -hmm. This is the story of movement, of people moving around. So he spent most of his life in Liberia, as I said, from the, um, from the age of 18 until his later years when he moved to Sierra Leone. So, I mean, I can only imagine what he left behind in Liberia, which we don't know. Um, and what we had left in Sierra Leone was not, was not much. And so this is, again, the story of the movement of black people and how so much get lost. And I think that we can tell the story of someone like him is, an, is, is a testament, um, that we can, in his history, go back to the late 18th century to his parents and their birth, uh, which is not usual for, for families of African descent in diaspora. So we feel lucky that we at least can know as much about him as we do know. Um, because there are many black families in diaspora that don't, mm -hmm. cannot do that. And so we're, we're very grateful for that. Okay. So what about his relationship? What about uh, Edward Blyden's relationship with the missionaries? So, of course, he came under the auspices of a missionary. So he was, for the early part of his time in Liberia, associated with the Presbyterian missionary. He did eventually fall out with the Presbyterian missionary, and that possibly can be accounted for because of his increasing questioning the role of Christianity in the lives of Africans. He made the argument that Christianity required Africans to give up too much, if you will. Elements of their culture, the, their conversion had to also be a westernization process, which he, he argued was not necessarily what Africa needed. Um, so in that sense, he gravitated towards Islam, although, as far as we know, he was never a convert to Islam. But he gravitated to the idea that Islam, in its converting Africans, did not require a complete change, did not require for them to give up elements or aspects of their culture, but rather integrated itself within, within African societies. And so, um, in the later years of his life, he spent most of his time within an Islamic community in Sierra Leone, working with Muslims, um, working in, with Mus in establishing Muslim schools. Um, his wife, common-law wife, my great-grandmother, actually opened up a, uh, a school for Muslim children and again worked among the Muslim communities. Blyden gave his four daughters, my grandmother and her sisters, Muslim names. Um, and so he was very much um, a believer that Islam was perhaps a, a more adaptable religion, if you will, for Africans than Christianity. Is, so is Nemata a Muslim name? Nemata is a Muslim name. My grandfather had four daughters and he gave them Muslim names. And um, so I, my father also had four daughters and gave us uh, the names of his mother, Isa, and her three sisters. And Nemata was one of his aunts. I see. And you mentioned that his wife actually helped in setting up schools. Was she a Muslim? She was not. 
Anna Erskine, who was my great-grandmother, was the granddaughter of a, an enslaved man from Tennessee, George Erskine, who in 1829 or 1830 uh, migrated to Liberia. And Anna Erskine um, was the daughter of his son, Hopkins. And so she and Blyden met in Liberia. Well, I want to thank you for exchanging these valuable insights.